My name is Nigel Hunt. I am a director and producer who has worked in the industry for the past 30 years, working in AEC and media and entertainment. I'm also a co-owner of Sinai Software, where we'll touch on some of the plugins, the 3ds Max plugins, uh, today in this talk. Uh, I am the editor of 3 Disciple, which is a ArcViz magazine. Right, let's look at Wembley Park, the project that uh, you've all joined me today for. Wembley Park in London, UK. So Quintain is the developer. It's one of London's most exciting new neighbourhoods and the largest single site of build-to-rent homes in the UK. Quintain acquired the site in 2002. Here on the right-hand side, we've got the master plan itself and a CGI of the site as it's progressed. Um, a few stats about the project itself. It's 85 acres, which works out at about 85 football pitches. Uh, we've worked on around 90 buildings. That includes the buildings on site and the adjoining neighbourhoods. And these include residential, commercial, retail, sports and leisure. Now, Quintang started on site in, well, commenced in 2002. And it's due for completion in 2027. So it's around 25 years of development. And there are 8,500 residential homes on site. A monstrous, massive site. And we have been looking after all the CGI side of it. So here, pre-2002, the old Wembley Stadium. It's quite industrial looking. How it looks this year, it's really charging through. Really, really, really massive project from one to the other. A pro um, progress, I should say. Looking at this over time, here is a little time-lapse animation we produce. It goes back to the 1770s, I think, working all the way through the centuries to where we're at now. This, of course, is sped up, and I've taken out all the information overlays that, that accompany the film, but we needed to research 250 or so years of how the site's changed. Here's our 3D model of where it stands today. As I, may, I mentioned before, we've been 12 years on this. In that time, I'm just showing you how many live models there are. There's, there's 750 or more. There's hundreds of XREFs. There's thousands of proxies. And again, we are still using 3ds Max and V-Ray. So looking then at the visualization project stages that we work to. I've broken that down into four stages. So stage A is the planning stage where we began in 2008. We were commissioned to work with the planning team on early concepts and site analysis. Following that we move through the design cycle. As the master plans approved, building plots are sent out to tender with architects and as they are selected, every architect has, has to use Revit and submit the Revit models to the, the project teams in which we then bring those Revit models into the master viz model for client review. Next, we have the construction stage where the 3D model is used not only for, for a planning and visualization side, but we also start to use that for looking at things such as temporary construction structures or tower cranes, vehicle logistics and pedestrian flows. And finally, stage D, we're looking at the marketing side of things. So that the highly detailed 3D model or digital twin of the site is used in PR, it's used in marketing for public to stakeholders, commercial and residential tenants. So we're producing films, images, 360 panoramas, schematic illustrations, and interactive apps, which we're going to get onto in a minute. Looking at that, 
and more diagrammatic form. You know, how's the project sort of moved through in stages? So if you like, if we start with from the left, we have the concept stage. So projects are actually saved into our client database. Once, once they've been approved, that will move through into the planning stage. So again, we're drawing down from the database into a specific project. As that gets refined and detailed, that gets saved back into the database. And you can see this circular process moves through the whole of the cycle until we get down to the operational level. Now, what we're doing when we get down to marketing and, and operation level in stage D is we're evaluating the model that we have against the as-built details and we're updating that model so it actually matches what has been built on site to allow us to finish off essentially with a digital twin likeness um, for our client. So here's a, a little sample of the, if you like, the concept design back in, in the early days right through to one of the CGI's, the aerial CGI's of the site. If we move on then to talk about the software pipeline that we're using. So at the start of the project and every project we work on, we, we have to assess the software that we use and also really look at the off-the-shelf limitations of that software. So we analyze our proposed pipeline and mixing and matching tools to meet our specific needs. We also aren't afraid of writing all our own tools, as I sort of mentioned before. So step one, we assess the brief based on our past experience. We then design a software plan and work methodology. We write scripts and bespoke plugins. And then we reassess every year or so that our pipeline is rock solid for that coming year. And adjust it as necessary. So looking at the image on the right, our primary tools we'll use for importing everything on this particular project is coming in in Revit. It's a requirement from the client itself that all consultants must use Revit on the project. Secondly, some will be using AutoCAD or, or other, other tools. 3D modeling is all done in 3D Studio Max, plus we're using the Sinai tools. So plugins, we're using Ignite extensively, plus we use Forest Pack. Rendering is all done in V-Ray. Real time, we are using Project Lavina, which I'll talk about in a bit. And then for 2D, we're using the Adobe Creative Cloud. Now, secondary to that, we do use other tools. So from a rendering point of view, on a project basis, we may use Corona, we may use Arnold. And of course, we do use Unity and we will use Unreal Engine as well. Like most studios, we'll use everything. Now, looking at our long-term 3D pipeline, we need to ensure that that scales. I think one of the things that most experienced visualizers will identify with is there is a tried and tested architect to visualize a workflow but we needed to look at how can we disrupt that can we actually make changes can we perfect it can we actually make it better is designing tools that speed up the iteration process useful is it going to ease the visualization team's frustration when each week or each month the architects resubmit the next iteration of a building and the visualizers have to actually redo all their work once again. Now that costs us money as a business so we need to actually look at how can we actually make cost savings and is an investment in software to, to do that going to be beneficial. We also need to look at how we future proof and protect against talent churn and software trends. Now what I mean by talent churn is project that lasts 12 years you'd be lucky if all of your team stick around for that time so your team are going to come and go but your project's going to stay with you for potentially 10 years or more so you've got to protect against that and actually put in place those methodologies that stay with you as a company and don't allow 
new talent to come in and actually try and change that without a really good reason. Uh, the same applies to software trends. Your project's going to be around for some time to make sure you are using tried and tested software. So here's the 3ds Max model. You can see we've got the on-site, but we've also built the surrounding context as well, just to allow us to be able to place the camera anywhere on site. I thought we should just dive into looking at the, the BIM to 3ds Max importing process, the steps that we go through for every model that comes to us. And this actually applies to every revision as well. Step one is importing. And we import everything as FBX. Next, step two, we prepare that 3D model for 3D Studio Max. Then we apply the materials and we save to the client database. And that then gets saved to the relevant zone model. Now, just looking at step two here, which is part of the, the prep process, for every model that comes in, we have developed a very efficient way of cleaning up and fixing these models before they get saved into the overall project database. Now, one of the tools that we recommend is Sinai's free forensic, which is available from the Autodesk App Store. But we also use Sinai's extensive plugin collection called Ignite, which allows us to create layers, consolidate all the imported objects to smaller smaller details. So we're, we're saving everything down to layers by materials. We're removing clutter. On a master plan, you may not want to have things such as door handles and tiny objects. So we'll use Jumble to just delete unwanted or unnecessary detail. And then we fix the geometry and remove things such as double faces. Now, a lot of visualization studios may opt to actually rebuild the imported models, but we have gone down a different route. And if I actually just talk over or show you a sample of what I mean. So here's forensic. I'm checking that scene. First things first is remove the CAD blocks. But you can see here, you can actually empty the layers. One of the things that's really important is look out for motion clips, animation layers, because they are going to come in sometimes with your Revit models, and they're going to really screw with you and, and slow things down. So you can see here from the layers that I just brought up, everything's coming on the default layer. So that's quite difficult to work with sometimes. So I've just run Ignite and created all the materials by layer, layer by materials, I should say, sorry. Um, now what I want to do is weld the verts. So I've opened up Sculpt and I weld all, all the verts. I am then going to attach everything by material. So that's going to collapse everything down into what is essentially 17 separate objects. We're going to clear the smoothing groups and unify the normals. Then finally, what I want to do is detach all the double faces that may have come in with the imported Revit model. So you can see here we've got 17 objects to run through. Uh, we really, really recommend that you collapse everything down to single objects or, or, or attach by material first. Otherwise, that process is going to take you quite some time. But they were all the double faces. So let's move on. Last thing, let's reset all the objects. And that model now is ready to be saved into the database. So that little film, that was running at double speed. But you can see it's a pretty quick process. So here's some of the 3D models, the images from them. Once we've brought the actual building models into the project, 
we then we've divided the master plan up into into building zones or separate zones now this allows us to actually work on in or within a zone it's much much easier to work but everything across the project is saved as v-ray proxies so the buildings become v-ray proxies the trees you name it it's all proxy so we, we have very much proxy workflow so it's quite optimized we also then save each one of the zone models there is a high and a low poly version of that if i just show you what i mean there here we've got in the top here one of these zone models everything as i mentioned is converted to a v-ray proxy to keep the scene as lightweight as possible now to manage the proxies we use sinai's ignite to quickly change the settings scene wide or is selected but it also allows us round trip conversion from proxies to edit mesh so let's just quickly have a look at what i'm talking about here so say here's one of our zone models now let's just say that the architect or someone's come and said let's change these bollards don't like them um for example well in this in this case let's change it to this lamppost i'm not sure why anyone would want to do that but then you can see now we've just changed it just like that here we have an edit poly now we want to convert that over to a proxy because we shouldn't really have you know geometry in the scene again using ignite's workflow tool we just select the folder this would go back to the database and then we convert that over to a proxy you can see here it's now a v-ray proxy we now change it to a different display format i've gone and changed that to a whole mesh which is probably not great for a demo neither is the bounding box there that looks ridiculous so let's just put that back to whole mesh you can see how quickly it is to change the display setting now let's say that you wanted to actually convert that back to edit mesh so i've just converted that back then i'm able to actually update or modify that and once complete i can just put that straight back into proxy again without anything moving around so that's now back as a v-ray proxy and then let's just we'll put that into preview mode and say also that you've got a whole load of trees that they've got different transforms on rotations etc and maybe landscape architect comes along and says look can you change that tree since everything's a proxy we can use the same technique and just update it just like that nice and simple now selecting everything and then putting the whole zone model back into or changing the display setting so let's put that back to bounding box update that and that should be that model complete but you can see it's a very very fast workflow working backwards and forwards with the the proxy back to edit mesh and, and back again so moving on that was looking at the database so everything involved from importing converting to proxies and saving the zone models in both high and low poly falls within the database now for each client project that comes in we treat that differently what tends to happen here is the zone models are xrefed into the project scene folders say for example you're working on a, or we, we've been commissioned to produce a bunch of images for an interior now that is a project folder so the zone models are xrefed into the project folders and then in that project itself all the cameras the 3d assets again if it's an interior things like the furniture uh, the lighting the textures everything related to that specific project stays within the project itself now this allows our artists to use other software so they could be using corona they could be using arnold and it doesn't affect or doesn't have an impact on the the database or the zone models 
Now, looking at that moving forward, or on these examples, you've got some interiors. These were done in Corona. But, for example, these were models that were x ref in from the database, and then we updated the detail to the courtyard. And that detail is then saved back into the database for other projects to use. So if we look at these 360 panoramas, it means that this, as we work on a project by project basis, any detail that we feel will be beneficial to the overall master plan, such as you know when we get down to street level, can be reused by other projects very, very simply. So all of this is 3D. Tons of these across the site, and they're able to visit site. They can use these on their phones. But it's also a really, really good way of inspecting each location and as buildings or are being developed and come online. Now, we have moved in the last year or so to real-time client reviews. Now, for this, we're using Chaos Group's Project Lavina. Why this is fantastic for us with a V-Ray pipeline or 3ds Max V-Ray pipeline is that there's no setup needed. All, all we need to do is export a VR scene and within a minute or two, we're up and running in Project Lavina. Now, the images here on the right-hand side are taken straight within Lavina. There's no rendering involved. These are essentially screen grabs. This year, it's allowed us to hold video conference meetings with our clients who many of them are working from home. So, you know, using a Zoom or another technique, we can actually take this model, which I'll show you now. We can, in real time, we can change the lighting. We can play around with it and we can get immediate client feedback. And again, it's all V-Ray. There's no need to update the textures or or no setup. This this took literally two minutes to bring into Lavina um, for this demo and show you what's going on. So it's proving to be very, very helpful for our clients and also for our own internal team. So we're using this just to inspect the model. You can see there there's some magenta floors that need to be textured. Okay, a little recap of the 3D Studio Max workflow. Starting from the left, always negotiate, if you can, a long-term retained contract. Uh, it's going to add value and benefit not just yourself, but it's going to benefit the client because you're going to be able to really relax and spend time getting them to the project. Next, assess your project software pipeline. Is it reliable and stable? We use 3D Studio Max and V-Ray. It's, it's proven to be incredibly beneficial to us. Assess your workflow. Are you factoring design progression? Your design is always going to move on until it's built. Optimize your master plan into manageable file sizes and zones. Make sure you do yourself a favor and do your computer a favor. Don't try and load everything all at once because it's unnecessary you don't need to do that build a client central database that's accessible to each new project that comes online and then finally create and use tools designed for your type of work in this case large master plans here's a bit of information about me if you wanted to reach out if you've got any questions then please do so i'd love to hear from you